it's a pleasure again, as, as every week, to invite you into my, uh, my living room uh, for our AMI, AFMI mining coffee chat, uh, where we try to address the uh, development uh, in the industry in terms of best practices, but also uh, evolutions of, of different jurisdictions of interests. Uh, we've worked a lot over the last few weeks on, on, on Brazil, on the Andean countries. We took a few case studies on, on, on Africa also, but I wanted specifically this week to uh, um, study and, and discuss uh, the, the, the situation in, in, in Guyana, in Suriname, in French Guyana, uh, the, the Guyana Shield jurisdiction that are so promising in terms of, of geological um, prospects and in terms of, uh, uh, of possibilities for, for um, let's say, sustainable industrial mining, if possible, in, in, in the long run. And also that actually has been experiencing a, a series of of especially political turmoil and unrest. And, and to be able to, uh, to discuss uh, on those three countries, I'm, I'm very uh, lucky to have Dominique, Dominique O'Sullivan, which uh, I had the pleasure to meet uh, a, few, a few months back in Georgetown, Guyana. Uh, Dominique, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you, Remy. Perfect, it's a pleasure. Thank you for, for joining us. I mean, Dominique is the, uh, the chairman of Tajiri Resources, uh, an exploration company uh, mainly focused on Guyana. You also have been until recently the uh, honorary consul of Australia to Guyana. So you're obviously uh, an expert of Guyana, but I think with you we'll be able also to discuss uh, the other jurisdictions, Suriname, uh, French Guyana. Uh, what's most interesting, especially on those three jurisdictions, is the fact that all three jurisdictions over the last two or three months have experienced uh, electoral processes, uh, national elections for Suriname and Guyana, municipal elections in France that impact French Guyana. And so we will see also the, uh, the impact that this will have in terms of, of, of mining um, news and, and development, especially with a series of, uh, of, of uh, activity around Guyana Goldfield over the last two weeks between uh, um, uh, Silver Corp on one side and Zinjin Mining on the other. So those are all the issues uh, that we'll likely address this morning. And as always, uh, I, I will invite you to, uh, to add some, uh, some questions or comments in the, uh, in the chat uh, of this uh, coffee chat. I'm more than happy to bring any question that you might have to Dominic to be able to discuss uh, those three jurisdictions which are fairly lesser known but actually have very strong uh, potential geologically. Maybe Dominic, uh, if I can maybe ask you, and we're going to start also, uh, I was about to forget this. Uh, Andreas, if you can actually share your screen, we're going to start with the the usual disclaimer that we have to, uh, uh, to read uh, every week. So um, uh, this is the disclaimer I'm, I'm told to read. The opinions expressed by today's panelists, so Dominique and Sullivan and myself, are their personal views and do not reflect the views of the organization that they represent. Uh, whenever possible, AMI has verified the accuracy of the information provided by third parties, but does not under any circumstances accept responsibility for any inaccuracies should they remain unverified. It is expected that webinar attendees will use the information provided in this webinar in conjunction with other information and with sound management practices. AMI therefore will not assume responsibility for commercial loss due to business decisions made based on the use or non-use of the information provided in today's webinar. Uh, so that was the, uh, the little dry introduction that we have to do every week. Uh, maybe if I want to continue, and Andreas, you can actually stop sharing your, your screen. Um, if we were to um, continue on this disclaimer, uh, uh, first take, D Dominic, maybe you want to, uh, to introduce yourself. I know you've been very active uh, on a series of, of, of uh, uh, companies, whether drilling company, exploration companies, so that'd be interesting for, for our audience to know a little bit more about yourself, more than I, I, I know you personally on a personal basis, but our audience doesn't know you. So please, uh, maybe introduce yourself if you can. Well, thank you, Remy. Yes, um, I'm an Australian, a geologist by trade. I've been in the business for about 30 years. Uh, and I arrived in Guyana in 1998, started living here permanently in 99. I was very active in the small scale business, uh, mining alluvial diamonds, alluvial gold. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I did that to keep myself in the game in Guyana because I saw the possibilities of the Guyana Shield when I arrived here in 98 doing project assessments. And of course, 98, was uh, post Brex and the collapse of gold price that uh, that bear market went through till really 9-11, uh, 2001. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, and I'd seen the possibility of founding a company here. So I did that in 2006. It took us uh, about four years to get going. Of course, we went 
when we were about to list, uh, we went marketing on the 15th of September 2008, which of course was the day uh, Lehman and AIG uh, died. Yeah. <laughs> so we met some headwinds. And 2010, we got going. That was a company called Azimuth Resources, of which I was the MD. We found, depending on which resource estimate you use, between 1.2 and 1.8 million ounces of gold. Troy Resources took over the company in 2013. Since that time, I purchased a drilling company. We've drilled in uh, French Guyana and Guyana for a number of clients. And in 2016, I joined Tajiri Resource Corp, looking to start another azimuth. So that's my background. Wonderful. And, and maybe, maybe just give a little background on, uh, on Guyana, on Suriname, on French Guyana, very, uh, uh, very quickly. And, and if you don't mind, Dominique, if you have a, a video camera, that'd be wonderful for our audience that we try to, to make this as, you know, entertaining oh, you are not seeing me yeah i'd, I'd like to see you I, mean, I, know, I know what you look like but my, my apologies <laughs> all right are you seeing me now now i remember i remember our last talk in the in the uh, in the lobby of the marriott in, in guyana i remember now i can, can recognize the face right away uh maybe just a, so i was mentioning a little a few a few background notes on, on those three jurisdictions um they have in common the fact that they are part of the guyana shield which has you know proven to hold large reserves especially in precious metal is the same uh, kind of, and uh, probably Dominique can say much more about this in terms of the geological uh, characteristic of Guyana, uh, very similar to what you have in Western Africa, obviously because of the, the split of Pangea. And I, I will leave that to you. You're much more of an expert uh, than I am. I, I'll talk much more on the aspects of, let's say, politics, geopolitics. It's a very active region, uh, uh, a series of jurisdictions Indeed. where, yeah, uh, unfortunately, a lot of mining companies or investors are. are have very few information on. I mean, we probably the only ones having, you know, assets on the grounds and, 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 and consultants in French Guyana, Suriname, in Guyana also. So being able to, to provide information almost on a daily basis. But it's true that there, there are jurisdictions that are hard to access. Uh, from Miami, there's a direct flight. I mean, when there's no, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we're not, we don't have to stay in no confinement, obviously. Uh, but outside of, 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 of Miami, it's a little harder to, to get to those countries. And that's what suddenly maybe why uh, a lot of, not a lot large number of mining companies operate in those uh, in those jurisdictions there's still newmont which is very active in suriname obviously and in french guyana uh, newmont i'm gold i am gold in suriname also, also. Uh, maybe other other if you want to maybe just give us a little bit of the uh, the lay of the ground uh, in, in lay of the land in terms of of, of of mining company and geology and then i'll complete in terms of the recent activity in terms of politics and economy if you want yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. So let's start in the east with French Guyana. There you have a couple of uh, local French companies. Uh, look, I, before I begin, yes, I, my office is just near the local airport, so I'll have to oh. have <laughs> paid passes. <laughs> the, two, the two airports in Guyana. Caravan for the uh, plane bus among you. So okay. French Guyana off in the east. Uh, you have Union Gold, a number of small uh, French companies. One of those is listed on uh, the Paris Stock Exchange. Uh, Newmont is quite active exploring there as well. I Am Gold has been there for a long time um, and they're still kicking around. And of course you have the Columbus Gold, Nord Gold joint venture at um, uh, Mountain Dor. Yeah. It's Saint Laurent du Maroni at the frontier between Suriname and, uh, and, and French Guyana, yes. That's right. But French Guyana has, has a little bit of a reputation for being quite hard in terms of bureaucracy, uh, in terms of regulation. And, you know, it, it, no modern deposits have got off the ground, you know, since, well, since forever, except for smaller scale local uh, miners. Then we move across to Suriname. Um, the main players there are Iron Gold and Newmont, both with active mines. Uh, Merion's about an eight million ounce uh, deposit uh, and Rosabelle for Iron Gold is about 14, 15 million ounces. Uh, there's not too many explorers, junior explorers left there. I believe 12 just listed, or T TLLV. Uh, they've, they're focused on the Lely Mountain project and I believe Reunion has a little bit of ground there. Uh, but between I Am Gold and Newmont, they've probably locked up a lot of the 
the hot properties already. Uh, not to say you, this is a highly prospective region, that's not to say that there aren't other opportunities. And then moving on to Guyana, we have probably the most activity at present. And uh, so we have two active mines, uh, Guyana Goldfields, which of course is being taken over by Zizin, and Troy Resources, which is what I discovered. We have on the exploration front, three discoveries made in the last 18 months, three very significant uh, discoveries. One by Troy at Ohio Creek, uh, one by Gold Source on their Eagle Mountain property, which looks like it's the potential source of a huge district of alluvial mining in the Mardia region. And of course, G2 Gold, which is the, uh, the people that founded and started Guyana Goldfields. Uh, then you have us, and we've just announced uh, major acquisitions, which are right next door to Troy's new discovery and Gold, uh, Gold Source's new discovery. We have Gold X, which is in development stage. And of course, everybody probably is aware of the news. Robert Friedland just joined the board there as chairman. Uh, that's about a 10.5 million ounce project. And so we'll, we can expect to see some action over the next two years as they go through all the hurdles of developing a project into a mine. And then there's a uh, gold, Guyana gold strike in the south. Um, uh, we also have Barrick is kicking the tires in here. Uh, they were in a strategic partnership with Reunion up till recently. Uh, Reunion, though they're focused more on French Guyana, do have some projects here and Ali Canto, who uh, have a large uh, uh, land, uh, land holding in the northwest of Guyana, uh, around the Arakaka region, and that is joint ventured with Nord Gold, uh, the, 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 the Russian. Yes, uh, absolutely. If, if, I, if, I want, if I want to follow on what you're saying, probably with a, a little bit of a high level analysis of, of economics and political situation in those three jurisdictions, they're very, very different, obviously. Uh, if you want more information, by the way, on, on, on all three from my standpoint, we did a countless due diligence and analysis in those three jurisdictions. I spent way too much time than I thought in Georgetown or in Panamaribo, in Cayenne, at least I'm French, so it was my homeland at this point, but we have very, a lot of, of information that we won't have time to disclose in that, in that uh, uh, coffee chat, obviously, but feel free to reach out either to me or, or to Dominic. Uh, but the idea here is that you have three jurisdictions that are very unique. Uh, obviously, French Guyana is is a French territory. It's officially a region yes. like any French territory. So it's a member of the European Union. Uh, it has to follow a series of, of obviously regulations that are linked to the European Union. It's complicated to, uh, to launch a mining project. Um, you know, I am Gold got issues with Concaima, as, as you were mentioning, to Dominique already probably more than 10 years ago. Uh, and, and that's still, you know, after, after the decision of the Bordeaux um, court, uh, there were still some, some follow-up uh, actions in, in I am Gold. So it's, it's a long process here, and you're absolutely right to say that. Um, but it's very interesting in terms of resources. It's also very interesting in terms of the capacity to ensure secure jurisdictions and, and limited Corruption, if I may say, to an extent, if you relatively compare to, to Suriname and Guyana, it's a much more steady jurisdiction. Yes. We'll come back to the politics of it afterwards. I'm more than happy to go into the French politics. That's my, my hobby, basically. Um, but you know, when we look at Suriname and Guyana, those are two countries that have discovered oil recently. Uh, Suriname mm -hmm. very recently, Guyana for a little more, let's say almost a decade, uh, seen the first findings. And we're talking about huge staggering levels of, 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 uh, of reserves of oil. Uh, if, if you just Google my name on YouTube or on Google, you'll find four or five different interviews specifically on Guyana and energy and, and natural resources and mining. So if you're interested in this, uh, there's plenty of information there. The problem is obviously it takes time for offshore resources to be uh, harvested. Uh, first drop of oil arrived at the moment where the price collapsed. Uh, and at the same time, the level of local content and the capacity to improve the economy is limited by the fact that it's offshore reserves more than something mm. that can be actually on the ground. Uh, there has been elections actually, uh, when was the first round of the election? Um, basically, the, it, March the second. Exactly, March the 2nd, uh, that was early elections following the default of one of the uh, opposition members, uh, majority member to the opposition. And then there was a series of, of, of discussions about whether or not 
uh, the count of votes was you know, up to standards. Uh, and as of today, we probably won't go too much into the, the politics of Guyana because President Granger has asked for a new recount this morning, or at least the, 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 the rejection of parts of the votes. But it was looking like the opposition would actually win the, the elections in Guyana. That's for Guyana. Um, it's been labeled the Qatar of the, uh, of the Caribbean, <laughs> of the Americas, because of its capacity of a very small, um, you know, relatively underdeveloped countries to become potentially uh, uh, an oil juggernaut over the next coming decades. Uh, and obviously the mining sector, which was the largest sector in Guyana until recently, until the energy findings, uh, became a little bit on, on, the, on, the, on the back seat, uh, but now is actually following the decrease of, of, of energy prices back on the front scene in Guyana, especially with the, the play around Guyana Goldfield. And I will have a specific question uh, uh, for you on, on this. Uh, and maybe just a few words on Suriname. Suriname is a fascinating jurisdiction in terms of understanding the politics of it. Uh, Desi Buters uh, has been president uh, for eight to 10 years, if I'm not wrong. He was a yes. former uh, according to Western Power, former dictator in the 1980s, uh, according to his, uh, his supporters, maybe might not use this, uh, this, this, this specific word, but obviously there's a, there was a series of, of, uh, of allegations against him. Uh, he was condemned in, in Holland for drug trafficking uh, in his absence. His son is in Miami in prison for trying to open a Hezbollah military base in Suriname. So it was a very complex situation and maybe not secure in terms of geopolitics or in terms of, of politics, but there's been... Um, elections uh, in May, uh, following the fact that Desiree Buteris was actually condemned by Suriname courts for uh, allegations of, of, uh, of killing his opponents in the 1980s, and it's been mm -hmm. by court. Uh, and so as a result, there's been additional new elections, and there should be a transition also in Suriname uh, towards what seemed to appear, and I'd like to get your views maybe on this, to be the, the exact opposite of Desi Buteris, meaning it was uh, uh, the leader of the position that's been working on you know, the court system, fighting against corruption. Uh, his reputation is actually good. Uh, I've met him ver just very briefly in the past and, and probably will try to meet him if I can travel there soon. But it looks like Suriname might actually turn the corner if Desi Buteris accepts the decision of the ballot, which is another issue. But we might be looking at a real change in political change in Suriname for the next few weeks month and years, which might be very interesting for mining investment. Now, trying to bring it back to the mining sector, and my question to you, Dominic, uh, since it's hard to comment on politics in Guyana with the ongoing discussion situation, uh, could you maybe just give us your, your perspective on uh, the um, dispute over Guyana Goldfield and the series of different bids, first from Civil Corp, then from Zin, um, then the arrival of Grand Cullen Gold into the mix, uh, which is owner of Goldex, and then you know uh, you know Zinjin. Can you maybe with more and uh, better eloquence explain what has happened and what's your views on Guyana Goldfield as a property and asset and the capacity of of, of uh, Friedman to develop Goldex? Right. Uh... Well, Guyana Goldfield has a, a little bit of a checkered uh, past. Uh, you know, they had mining difficulties. They had difficulties with um, waste stripping to keep up with production. And uh, that wasn't entirely their fault. Some of it was design issues regarding the pit. So when you get problems like that, that other parties believe are solvable, you become a takeover target. Um, and I think it was just a question of, what was the value assigned? And you know, we've had a, had a very uh, good run in gold this year. So that's sort of sparked the laddering of the bids up. And Zijin being Chinese, love to pay cash, take 100%. And they've, they've won that bids, pure and simple. The future of the asset, it, they, they, there is a lot of exploration ground. Um, there's also, I think it's 700,000 ounces, maybe 1.6 grams across the river at so Sulphur Rose. Uh, but the, the majority of the remaining known resources is underground, mm -hmm. um, which will need a higher gold price or, well, or a higher gold price is more fav favors its development. So I think they, it was quite a good strategic move by Zijin. It's also an expansion for the first time of a Chinese state mining company in gold, because we have some of the bauxite, the Bosai Mines runs Linden um, into the, the gold mining sector in Guyana. And I think uh, Zijin, 
Zhijin's had difficulties in third world environments with social license. Yes. They just lost um, uh, the, 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 the poor green New Guinea. Yep. And Guyana, because of, you know, 700,000 of the 780,000 people live right on the coast, the interior is deserted. So you have, you don't have as much opportunity. You're not building a mine next to a village of 5,000 people or something like that. You might have a small Amerindian reserve with a couple of hundred people and they're quite dispersed. So social licenses or social issues in Guyana are much easier for miners to deal with. Yeah, so especially, especially for Zinjin. I mean, they've, they had issues in, in Peru with Rio Blanco. They apparently yes. took over continental gold where I mean, the, the work on social license to operate, I'm talking about Antioquia, Colombia, uh, um, the work on social license to operate was done very well by Continental Gold. So they should be able to move forward in a, in a, in a jurisdiction, and especially around uh, Continental Gold, um, Buritica, where there was a lot of uniform miners. This is not an issue that they will face in Guyana. Uh, community issues are, are as, as you were saying, much, much lesser. Um, there are, however, other issues in Guyana that we should not- Oh, yes. It, operational specifically and, and maybe to transition on Goldex. Goldex is a very remote site and, and very complex potentially to bring to your, to production. What's your take on this? Do you think that there's actually a, a strong potential with the, I mean, um, the level of, of, of regulations, the level of, of administrative uh, development that needs to be done, uh, especially with oversight from, you know, there's you know, links between Guyana and the government of Norway, there's different in you know, a place. How do you think, what do you see the potential for Goldex now? Look, I, I, I think it's, it's finally become very good. Uh, you know, it's, it's a project that's been a long time coming. I looked at that with uh, John Adams and Rick Munson back in 1999, when it was just a artisanal open pit. I agreed the project was great, but as you said, the location is a little arduous. However, since that time, and that's 22 years, We've had a major road pushed through the bush there. So they do have quite good access. Okay. It's, it's, it's also a road that is in part being used by uh, other, other miners in the area. Um, they will have to upgrade that. But the, the big hurdle for that project was that the first resource they found had uh, about 0.1 to point point. 0.12% copper, which is a little bit low, well, quite low, makes it hard to, it interferes with the extraction of the gold. But over the last, let's say seven years, they've, five years, they've proven almost a million ounces at Sonner Hill, which allows them to get a starter, a project started with just a CIP plant. And that's been the game changer for them. So, yeah, when you, when you look at, uh, your NPVs that all bankers are going to look at, they're much better with just a straight gold start and a payback. So, yeah, I think there's a very, there, there is a bright future there despite the difficulties. Now, having said that, we'll just let these... Um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry, I'm not. Pass here. <laughs> You're in the busiest part of Georgetown, Guyana. It's not the biggest city. <laughs> no, the, pro, the, the, the... Yes, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, and, and in terms of regulations for Guyana, uh, permitting and regulations are really quite easy. Um, you've got to get all your ducks in a row, but the time it takes to get things permitted is not all that long. If you look at the history of Guyana Goldfields and Troy, from Troy's decision to uh, mine and start financing was about 18 months it took for them to get regulatory approval. And Guyana Goldfields is about two years. If you're in the West or in French Guyana, yep. you can be looking at five years as a minimum. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And maybe, maybe just to, to rebound on, on this issue of, of regulation, I, I agree that you know, the, the regulation um, process is, is, is much easier in, in, in Guyana. One risk to it, however, that some of those regulations are still in development or are fairly new and, and there's an issue of potential if, if, if some of the regulation are not strong enough and there's any kind of environmental impact down the road I and mean, there's a potential uh, you know backlash on the reputation of the company because NGOs especially in French Guyana are very active and, 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 and the frontiers between French Guyana, Suriname and Guyana especially the French Guyana and Suriname one I mean the 
<laughs> the Maronier River is, is very porous here. And so you, have, you do have interaction between those three, the, the, the three jurisdictions. Maybe one, one thing I wanted to mention that because Raziel just brought a very good and, and, and correct uh, uh, information, the fact that uh, Zinjin actually already is a stakeholder into Guyana Gold Strike. So um, I, I also has, has a knowledge of, of Guyana. But looking at that specific project of, of Guyana Gold Strike, when I look at the Marodi Gold project, I mean, the Marodi Mountain is where you did have displacements of population, uh, a series of, 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 of discontentment and opposition from communities to Guyana Gold Strike. I think this is fairly over, but that has raised a lot of headlines in Guyana. Not that everybody reads, I'm probably the only one reading Guyana Press with you, Dominic, uh, in this chat. But that was, that was an, uh, an example of where you, have a, a, you had an opposition between communities and the mining projects in the Marodi Gold uh, Mountain, right? Yes, that, that, that is true. But a lot of the population um, were involved in, in mining, in artisanal mining of Maruti, and they were being displaced. What had happened, the, it was originally a, pro, well, let's go to the, the, the recent past from the 90s. We're not going to go back to when uh, Max Lee Pugsley, who was a, <laughs> The son of a uh, Canadian mining engineer in the 40s was, was down there for gold and stuff. Anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a long history in, in that place. Um, most recently, uh, oh, gee. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> Continue. Right. Yes, you want uh, to so, uh, Sorry, I've just drawn a blank on the names of the companies that had it in the 90s. Anyway, they ended up. Um, it ended up with Guyana, Guyana Frontier, I think. Yes, Guyana Frontier was. They're, they're now gone, um, but there's there was a long transition. Whilst there were still licenses belonging to that company, there was no work going on for 10, 12 years, which allowed the artisanals to come in and the problem to develop. So when you try and take away something that has been given for free, things start to get difficult. That's not the only reason for the problem, but I think that's uh, the major underpinning of that particular uh, problem there at Maruti. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, and, and in terms of institutions, you're, you're quite right. Um, the, the standards in you know, Suriname and Guyana are probably not as good as the West or maybe even West Africa, but you know, you're looking at the institutional capacity of a country that has 4,000 US per capita GDP. Yeah. Now that's going to get a lot better with the oil production, which is going to, you know, anywhere between quadruple and 10 times GDP over the next decade. So we can expect to see um, much higher standards, but the companies that work here, like Troy and Goldfields tend, and uh, I am Gold, do tend to hold themselves to quite high standards irregardless, because they can see that you know, the world as a whole is developing and, and going forward. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe one, one or two uh, uh, additional comments on Guyana in case some of you start doing research on Guyana and the potential that it has. You will see a series of headlines on Venezuela because there's a border dispute since the 19th century over the Essequibo reserves, but this should be actually solved in the very next few weeks with the ICJ ruling that has, by all, all factors, has, has seemed to have confirmed that this region will be confirmed to Guyana. Uh, so that's something that should not be too much of a of, of a concern for you. Uh, one specific also uh, of Guyana uh, is that the, the population is really split between Afro-Caribbean and Indo-Caribbean, both of them supporting very fairly, you know, directly one party. And that's why you have sometimes of a, a lack of cohesion between the, the, the two sides of the population. That's why we need to, to monitor very closely over the next few weeks and months, especially at this time of, of uh, let's say, political disputes over, over who won the, the most recent election. If I can use that maybe to, to turn towards the next country on the line, which is Suriname. Um, what are the relations between Guyana and Suriname? Uh, what are the differences in terms of the way that mining uh, has been developed in both countries? I mean, there's the beautiful stories of the port knockers in Guyana and the, the tradition mm -hmm. of the port knockers in Guyana. Uh, but you know, the one uh, Suriname is slightly different. Uh, can you maybe just try to give us a, a, an expose of, of the recent development in Suriname in terms of, of mining with the presence of you know, Newmont with Median, with, uh, you know, Suriname in Roosevelt, where I went to recently, uh, and, and how this has been different from Guyana, especially. Oh, all right. Well, l let me just take a little detour first. 
And I think the, the two jurisdictions have quite different mining laws. Um, Guyana has been very focused on the small scale, the uh, you know, people that produce a couple of hundred ounces a year. Guyana's small scale production is much greater. And the land tenure system is geared towards the small scale people. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what happens in Guyana, you get a, either a 28 acre parcel or an up to 1200 acre parcel. Um, and those you can essentially hold forever. <coughs> yes. In Suriname, they have a much more Western style system where you've got to use it or lose it. So you've got to do your exploration. There's very good defined stages and the mines department sticks to this. So that's a huge difference between the two jurisdictions. So opportunities come up more frequently for straight pegging in Suriname. Whereas in Guyana, you really have to go and do deals with the locals, yeah. which is where there's a handful of people who are in this country that can do that. Uh, your friend Roger Connors, Pat uh, Sheridan, myself, uh, among those. Um, Suriname, yes, so there's a, I think it's a five-year prospecting phase. You've got to lose 25%. There's a five-year uh, development phase. You've then got to drop off 25% and then you move to mining. Um, in terms of taxation, uh, Suriname has a lower royalty. Guyana's got a 5% royalty. But uh, with large operations, yes. Troy and Goldfields are subject to 8% on the value of gold above $1,000 an ounce and 5% on the value of gold below $1,000 an ounce. Um, w one other thing that it's an outshot of the, the politics at the moment, uh, banking in Suriname is quite arduous because of various anti-corruption, anti-money laundering controls there. And with the victory of the new government who are standing for you know, business and anti-corruption, they're hoping that a lot of those controls will be removed over the next you know, six to eight months as they um, fall in line with, with uh, the rest of the West. So, if, 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 if I just question on that. Just to build on this, you mentioned uh, you know the, the the levels of royalties, which is different in in, two can in both countries. I think something important to mention is that you know those levels of of, of um, royalties are higher than in Brazil, and and as a result, you have a very large share of the production, which is the same production, either through garimpeiros or or port knockers in Guyana, that sometimes that gets smuggled through the through the forest back into Brazil and therefore doesn't provide the perfect you know quanti quantities and information on how much gold has been has been uh, produced uh, in those jurisdictions what's what's your take with the relation with Brazil specifically well look that that was probably not the case until the current government got in power where uh, in fact you might have get, been having some gold being smuggled in from Venezuela to yeah. sell in Guyana just for a 5% royalty because there was no income tax for small-scale miners. They just had to pay their royalties. So it's quite an attractive regime. The current incumbent government or caretaker government now, whilst we have the, uh, whilst the results of elections are pending, introduced a tax uh, for the small-scale miners. So that was standard income tax and it became much more arduous. So I would expect that there's been more gold leave the country in the last two, three years since that legislation. Now, having said that, though we have a high royalty in Guyana, there are a number of other offsets to that. Uh, one of those is there's not, there, there are no thin capitalization laws here. So you can, a parent company developing a mine can loan the money in, pay back at quite you know, good commercial interest rates. You know, local business rates here are anywhere between eight and 16%. So, there's ways that you can disappear your, your uh, net profits or income, uh, but still pay the royalty, right? It, so, if, 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 I, if I want to, to just you know, turn also towards the, the, the future of mining in, in, in Suriname specifically, I mean, if, if Desiree Guterres 
uh, follows the decision of the, of the ballot and steps down, which is a big if to start with. Uh, but if Chen Santuki, the, uh, the, the, the leader of the position, actually steps into power, uh, what's the views that you have on the on a, on a, on a Santuki administration? What is the, uh, the vision that you would see that you know, would be different types of practices than, than Desiree Buteris would implement? And we all know of the, the links between Desiree Buteris and large small scale miner uh, from his close, uh, I mean, I don't want to get too much into detail, but you know what I'm Yes. Right. Will that be the same case in terms of Chan Santuki? Look, I, I, if, if Buteris remained in power, my, my opinion is I, I think he, he will step down, uh, but if he remained in power, you'd see more of the same. Uh, obviously, it'd be hard to do business because of banking restrictions and his sort of um, the younger generation, the younger Butazay generation would probably still have their fingers in a few uh, mining assets or exploration plays, let's say. Right, uh, that that's something that has been notable in Suriname. Um, so, but, you know, Suriname, I'm not an expert on Suriname. Guyana is where I am. <laughs> I, I understand. Maybe just one thing, on, on, last thing on Suriname, and then we move back to Guyana and French Guyana. I promise, once we move to French Guyana, I might be talking for five hours straight and lecturing like the oh. university professor that used to be. But the idea is, uh, when you're looking at, at Suriname, um, the last few months have been marked by, you know, I am gold uh, facing some security issues next to its Rosabel mine. Uh, I'm not fully at liberty to say what I know about this because of proprietary information, but you probably have the capacity and liberty to discuss about this. What, what have you read, especially in a, in, a, in a situation between IM Gold and, and, uh, and, and informal miners? Is security an issue in the larger Guyana Shield, specifically Suriname and Guyana, because French Guyana is specific? Please let me know. Look, um, there are several... that. Not in, not in general. Like uh, I, I think it, I, I feel generally very safe here. There are a couple of areas I won't walk at night. There's a, quite a bit of petty crime, but there's no endemic security issue. No organised terrorist organisations. Even the drug smugglers, and this, of course, this whole coast is uh, 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 the the jump off point to fly to West Africa and take drugs to Europe over the Trans-Saharan route. Um, you know, there, there's no gang warfare or anything like that going on like there is. Yeah, like, it's, a, it's a very peaceful, Columbia. those are very peaceful uh, cities. Very peaceful, yeah. right? Um, and so the, the security issues that Iron Gold have faced, uh, I, I believe they were related to a local, an artisanal miner was shot. Yeah. Um, but was he even shot by IM Gold security forces? I don't so, think so. But let, 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 let just, let's just summarize. If, if any of, of people listening are interested into investing in, 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 uh, in companies, whether junior miners or, or taking shares of, of companies operating at a larger scale in the Guyana Shield, just be very cautious of, of what kind of security protocol I put in place and a relationship that can be implemented with communities and with you know, small scale miners, especially the ones having, you know, a good relationship with people in power in both in both Georgetown and, and, and Panama Ribo, which would be true in every jurisdiction. But I would just encourage uh, anyone to just be very cautious in their due diligence on that very specific front uh, with uh, yeah, look, small scale miners. Look, yeah. one, one way to get around this, uh, and it's, it's, it's not quite, you know, applicable to Iron Gold, but at the exploration stage, a number of the companies, Azimuth, which I ran, uh, G2 Gold's doing it now. Um, I know uh, Gold X had, had done it in the past. They allow some of the small scale guys to continue working. They're only working alluvials. They're not harming anyone. They're not sucking up your resource. You limit them, of course, from working primary material. It's not like West Africa, where you have an army of 5,000 people show up in your property and start digging a hole by hand. This is, these are hydraulic operations, you know, eight people in a team. That, that, that's smaller, absolutely. On your property is not going, to, not going to create a problem. So you can get along very well with those people. And in fact, those guys end up doing a lot of free prospecting for you. 
yeah, yeah. I'm not, we, I agree. We, we actually have a lot of material on, on, on the LinkedIn group. I know Andreas just put it in on, on the chat. We have a lot of material of how to interact with informal miners, with uh, small scale miners, with whether depending on the, on the, on the typology of, of, of what we're talking about into the ASM world. Indeed, I completely agree that, you know, one of the main way to make sure that you don't have in that day, you limit issues that you mitigate risk is just to strike a deal with those, you know, informal miners to work on your property on very select sites with specific guidelines in terms of contracts. We have these if anyone is interested uh, and making sure that sometimes those actually, especially in jurisdiction where there's more risks than in Guyana, Suriname or others where there's much more criminal activity and money laundering. It's not so much the case in Guyana and Suriname in terms of using gold as, as a money laundering tool, at least at, at the industrial level that you can have in some parts of Peru, Colombia, Mexico, in Africa, and some places. But in that case, the informal miners can actually become your ramparts, your wall against criminal organization in the sense that they are, you actually host them into your property. You understand the community relations between the miner and the community is actually stronger than between the community and the criminal organization. And therefore, they have no reasons to actually become, they have more of an incentive to work a deal with the, 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 the formal mining company in place. So we have a lot of this material uh, that is available on, the, on, our, on our LinkedIn group. Uh, but I'll be very uh, you know, straightforward in, in, in mentioning the fact that one of the risks that you have in the Ghana Shield is the political risks. Um, it is the fact that there's a very centralized system in Guyana compared to some other federal, more federal system that you might be uh, accustomed to in Canada and Australia and other places. Uh, but it was almost uh, very hard to develop um, let's say a, a project, a large scale project in Suriname without having to agree to a certain uh, level of, of friendship with Desiree Wouters, let's put it this way. Yes. Newmont New did, did a better job. They actually uh, have their, they finance their own police station. They have a lot of uh, much more engaging, proactive uh, uh, approach to, to mining in, in, in Suriname. But you have to be extremely cautious and you want to be very, you know, um, vigilant of the implementation of your protocol in, in those jurisdictions. But I mean, uh, Dominic and myself, we're more than ha happy to, to, to help you on this. Maybe on French Guyana, can you maybe just, uh, uh, we're going to be talking 10 minutes on French Guyana, can maybe do the, the introduction of what's your views on French Guyana from Guyana, otherwise the, the crazy French lost in the, uh, in, in, the, in, in the north of Brazil in the little territory, or how do you look at them? Look, the food and wine is great. The champagne is really cheap. Uh, you know, Guyana has expensive import and uh, Suriname expensive import taxes on champagne. You get it at local prices. So, you know, whatever you want, a, a bolly, a, a verve, a, a, ma, a mum, you know, whatever, you, know, you get it at a cheap price. So, and, you know, a lot more restaurants over there that are very, very good. Actually, uh, some good places there. They're really some good places. Getting on to the serious part of things. Uh, <laughs> Well, you, you pointed out that we just had uh, the municipal elections there, but I believe they've been delayed until November uh, or in only partly completed because of the coronavirus case. Now, French Guyana has got some, it's probably the worst off. They're at about 2,300 cases of coronavirus versus you know, a few hundred in Suriname and Guyana. That may, those statistics might be skewed a bit by people, Brazilians coming across the border there. Uh, but what that has done, uh, you know, French Guyana's economy relies on the uh, European Space Centre and Ariane launches and all the associated employees there, and very much on ecotourism from mainland Europe. Of course, that ecotourism dollar has just shriveled. So there is an undercurrent that's becoming a little more pro-mining in French Guyana at the present time. So that's uh, my take on specific questions here. Let me continue. You're probably more an expert on Guyana than I am, and I'm probably more an expert on French no, Guyana. No, I, I know. I know but, a bit about French Guyana because I drilled there for. Ah, oh. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's a little bit maybe for, for um, uh, background information. There were elections, yes, indeed, this, this uh, Sunday in the entire territory of France. The case of French Guyana was very specific uh, because of the level of COVID 19. Uh, the municipalities were the first round of elections that haven't led to the elections of a mayor. Those ones have been postponed. So we're talking about eight out right. of. To, uh, uh, you know, elections in, in French Guyana. Most of the important cities 
uh, or the ones impacted or linked to, to mining. If you're looking at Saint Laurent to Maroni, you're looking at Mana, for example, you're looking at uh, Maripasula, uh, all those cities have actually elected their mayor in the first round, so the elections for them has passed. However, here's the big picture that you need to have on French Guiana. Um, the elections have been won in France by the Green Party. Uh, for the first time, the Green Party is, and, and the Green Party in France is slightly different, it's more German Green Party. It's a very pro-European uh, center left with some issues left uh, in, in politics, but they won the big cities there. Now the mayor in Lyon, in Marseille, in Paris, in Bordeaux, in, in, in most of the larger cities that you can think in France, and that has given a big change in terms of the balance of power in France. Uh, Macron needs to uh, work with the Green Party. There's been a uh, uh, citizen uh, congress that led to 150 measures uh, on climate change and environment and in that measures there's one moratorium on mining uh, projects in French Guiana. This moratorium, uh, Macron confirmed this morning, will be put in place in French Guiana. Does it change something? Not so much because it's a moratorium on industrial projects for the next two years and no industrial projects were about to be built in French Guiana for the next few years. It's obviously not a good, uh, not a perfect uh, environment for further development in the mining sector in, in French Guiana. How do you work in French Guiana, Guyana or Suriname? The only way to work, and you can be fairly effective, is really to ally yourself with local actors. Uh, there are some in French Guiana. We see Newmont that made a deal with uh, the Mine Espérance, uh, which is owned by the Ostero family, which is a historical family in the mining sector in, uh, in French Guyana, uh, let's say small scale industrial. Uh, and you have the same kind of, of approach that has been made to a certain extent by Barrick with Brain Gold. You have other actors that have done the same in Guyana and Suriname. It's absolutely essential to actually understand the, uh, the situation of the territory, which is very specific. The actual indigenous or native communities of French Guyana are usually in favor of mining, surprisingly. The ones that are against are the civil servants uh, that have a four or five years contract in French Guyana and feel it is based on their responsibility to protect the Amazonian forest before they go back and retire uh, in north of France or one way or another. So that becomes, because of the importance of the public sector in the in, uh, in, in French Guyana that becomes a very strong influence on media, a very strong influence on debates and the way that Columbus Gold and No Gold have approached the, the situation of Montagne d'Or, which was, if I want to be caricatural, uh, with a very Russian approach of large for, you know, like large billboards saying, we are the future of French Guyana, taking the, the, the anthem yes. of French Guyana without an authorization, taking photos of kids of the opposition without authorization. It was a really top-down approach that led to complete antagoniz uh, antagonism of, of populations in French Guyana for the next one to two years. Uh, so at the same time, if I want to be fairly positive, because I do believe in mining as, as a vector for creation of value far away from the cities and therefore a, 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 an opportunity for territories that want to create you know, sustainable development far away from, from urban uh, region. There are some possibilities to do this in French Guyana, but you need to work with the understanding of, let's put it this way, forward thinking Green Party leaders or forward thinking center left or center right leaders. There are some in France that it's not, as I said, it's not a, um, as I say, a very revolution, revolutionary Green Party. It's not, that's not this way, but you will have to be stellar on your track record of, of being able to invest in French Guyana uh, in terms of the quality of your investment. And you will have to be very cautious of engaging step-by-step step with, with French speakers. And um, there are a few people that we can advise uh, for you in French Guyana. If you were to look at that to understand and, and get to work with the local ASM or short, uh, small scale industrial miners uh, that, that do work and operate there without a, a clear uh, partnership in French Guyana with one of the you know, historical actors, you will not be able to, to implement a project in French Guyana, especially under the, 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 those, those conditions. So as, as of, you know, in generally, this is a region which has a very large potential in terms of geology. Um, everything oh. that, yes. And, but at the same time, the political instability makes it complicated to operate. How do you do it, therefore, Dominic, if I want to... You look like... Number one, make sure any equipment you're using in French Guyana is European compliant. Engines for yep. four-wheel drives, drill rigs, any of that. Also, 
uh, one of your points, you said um, engaging with the local miners. Yes, that's very important. But also, I think another issue with uh, Nordgold and Columbus there was engaging local suppliers, or at least giving them a shot at tendering for, you know, supplying trucks, backhoes, catering, all of those sorts of things. And I think maybe Columbus's initial or Nord's initial uh, feasibility or, or was based on quotes that didn't involve too many locals. And I mean, French Guyana is quite an advanced uh, country, you know, and um, it's a very pleasant place to live. I must it's, say. A, it, it's, it's a great place to be. And obviously, uh, there, 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 was, there was an understanding from the Macron administration at the very beginning. I mean, the Sherpa of Macron, which is Jacques Attali, so the guy that trained Macron to become president, was actually on the board of Columbus Gold. Uh, mm. So there, there, there's, a, there's a track record of, of understanding and during the, of, of the, the, the added value that mining under the right condition can actually bring to a territory. French Guyana is a huge financial hole for France in the sense that a lot of, you know, uh, welfare, uh, a lot of, uh, of support to territories that are underdeveloped compared to the rest of France. Uh, basically, there's a huge uh, transfer of, of, of money every year to, uh, from France to French Guyana with a, a clear desire from the French administration to try to resolve this, to try to create some local development, industrial development. Uh, so if you're interested into investing in French Guyana, that's probably the best place in terms of incentives, in terms of, uh, of uh, providing you tax cuts for the next 10 years uh, of, of subsidies to some of your operation. There's really the entire arsenal of European subsidies uh, for an underdeveloped territory. However, as I said, it's really a territory where you have to be extremely cautious of understanding and engaging with communities. And when I say communities, it is, as you were mentioning, Dominic, it's also the ecosystem of companies, uh, the suppliers, people that would benefit economically and socially from more local development. And as a result, less presence of, uh, um, less presence of, uh, of other illegal activity around. We just lost Dominic, by the way. I apologize for this. Just send me a message that power just cut off. Welcome to Guyana. That's something that can, that can happen. Uh, but I'll try, therefore, to wrap up for him and feel if, if uh, he's just to ask any question. But in that case, if you want to be successful in French Guyana, if you want to be successful in Guyana and Suriname, engaging with local actors is the number one key. Being very clear of, of fighting and, and building regional alliances I mean, we talked about this in Ecuador, we talked about this in Colombia and the way to operate in Antioquia. We, we talked about this on, on, on Peru, Chile, and, and other places in Africa, that it's essential to motivate and explain the interest for the people that tend to stand on the, on the sideline and not take part to a debate, um, to explain why some of the arguments, some of the comments that might be stereotypical or that might be caricatural from the opposition has to be debunked with actual facts and science and other aspects, how this actually in the long term, you know, mining can really be a vector of knowledge management, of creation of value, capital, human capital, uh, and, and also knowledge uh, in territories and therefore be a vector for development. Uh, so this is really the, the, the way that we advise people to operate, especially in the Guyana, uh, in the Guyanas, uh, understand, and, and we're more than happy to stay, uh, you know, to answer any question that you would have with this very evolving situation with uh, President Granger refusing to step down in Guyana for the moment. Uh, Desi Rebuteris having been beat in ballot, but having a tendency to want to get, you know, stay on, on hold of power and the, uh, the local elections in French Guyana, there's a very evolving uh, situation politically, but also that means there's also some very good opportunities uh, for people that are ready to understand the context uh, that will be uh, especially looking at, at a favorable evolution in, in Suriname uh, with a transition of power, a potential, uh, they say, peaceful eventually transition in Guyana because the entire international community from the OAS to the United Nations to uh, Washington to all the, uh, the European uh, embassies that have a very strong influence in Guyana uh, are pushing for a peaceful transition of power in Guyana. So you will have new teams in place with new strategies and, and new uh, perspective for development of mining in Guyana and Suriname. And in the case of French Guyana, it is adopting a more steady perspective, watching what will happen over the next two years during the moratorium, which will not have an impact directly on investment in French Guyana, obviously, because there was not going to be industrial projects in the next two years. And then elections are arriving in 2022, where you might see uh, that there will definitely be a plan for French Guyana, and there's not a hundred solution for French Guyana. 
uh, even the uh, as as the Razia is, is talking about you know SpaceX, uh, I, I know very well the uh, the space the, the space program in French Guiana. It's called Ariane. My daughter is called Ariane out of it. So that's why you know I've been there. And I came spent a couple time there. They're about to lay off a series of their workers uh, because of the competition from SpaceX and because of the competition from other uh, from other. Um, countries that are ramping up their efforts. And as a result, uh, that source of employment, that source of wealth from French Guiana may very well dry out. That there were the first plans for layoffs uh, that was being you know, talked about last year. Uh, and if the uh, you know, special program uh, oil has not been, uh, there's a more, there's, oil will not be harvested ever in French Guiana, uh, a decision by Macron four years ago, or three years ago. Uh, the only way to move forward is e either ecotourism, which is limited and can be actually uh, in 90% in of the territory, but also probably uh, a sustainable industrial mining that will gather the forces from, uh, you know, the different business uh, actors because they do exist in French Guyana. It's one of the territory in France that has the largest population of very wealthy French people. It's top, I mean, top five uh, territory in France. Uh, it's a lovely place to be in when you're actually uh, ready to retire with some money. <laughs> I assume it's the Miami of France, maybe. Uh, but the idea here is that if you actually gather support to your project, you explain it correctly, you understand the political game, you understand the influence that is there between, you know, Rodolphe Alexandre at the region, uh, the different ministers in France, the, the game that is being played by native Guyanese and French from Paris, the post-colonial mentality behind it. There really are avenues to present a project sustainably and have the favors down the road uh, to both from Paris and, and from, from Cayenne, if you know how to work the uh, the, 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 the different path and processes to arrive there. Um, I do realize that we're arriving at the last two minutes. Uh, so I just wanted to maybe uh, thank you again for, uh, for this. Uh, I appreciate as always your presence. Uh, we will do, I already have the lineup of speakers for the next four coffee chats. So we're not stopping even if you find a cure at COVID, which I hope we do. Uh, but even if I will be traveling back, I hope to go back on the road and as I used to be traveling 49 weeks straight, I, I'm, I like to go back on the road like I used to do. I will do those coffee chats from wherever I am if I'm able to travel in the near future. And I think that's a great way to interact with you guys. So don't hesitate to you know, send me questions by email or during this chat. Uh, we're here to try to provide you an understanding of how to uh, mitigate above the grand risks and, and make sure to create some consensus and support to sustainable investment in the mining sector by making the case of value creation with, with different actors. So. Uh, um, I will, uh, usually I say goodbye to my guest, but he disappeared because of uh, uh, energy issues in Guyana. Uh, but I will just, you know, take the last minute to thank you very much for you to be there. And I wish you a very good, uh, very good afternoon. Just reach back if there's a specific topic of interest for you in the near future. Okay. Cheers. I see you. And Neil saying bye. Okay. It was a pleasure to see you guys. Cheers.